Pleased to welcome Kenneth Braswell and his daughter in Zynga to this program. They join us to talk about their documentary, A Queen's Discovery, which chronicles their 2015 mission trip to Africa. Before our conversation, here now a clip from A Queen's Discovery. What I saw that was different from how it was at home is everything. Like the houses are not the same, the people are not the same. I mean, Usually when you see, usually a lot of times you see like homeless people like laying on the ground and stuff like that. I probably seen about three people laying on the ground. The rest of them were up working, doing what they had to do to make money and eat and survive. And that's very different from how things are at home. And the schools, every, I mean everything is different because this is a different place. The schools, the buildings, the people, everything. But I mean, that's just how it is. A Queen's Discovery can be seen over most of these PBS stations on December the 9th. Uh, again, I'm honored to have both Kenneth and Nzinga on this program tonight. Good to have you here. Thank Good to you. be here. Let Thank me you. start with the obvious, at least for me. What is the value, Kenneth, the benefit of a father taking his daughter to Africa? Um, it's immeasurable. Yeah. It's priceless um, to watch her open up, to watch her mind broaden over the span of nine days. I mean, she was 16 when I took her. And all the fathering I gave her in 16 years, I don't believe had the same impact that this trip to Africa had on her in nine days, particularly her perspective of the world, mm -hmm. who she is as a girl, and how she sees not only um, black America, but the black world. There's a lot there. Tell me first, though, um, your reason, rationale, experience, taking your daughter and not your son? Well, my son is too young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Nzinga is my game changer. Yeah. And so she is what has changed my life. Uh, from the day that she entered this world, um, my life changed. And she has always been my most broad-minded child with respect to really wanting to understand the world. Mm -hmm. And I remember how impactful Africa was on me when I went for the first time. And I knew that she would share in that same experience. So it was important for her to go, particularly given that her name is African. Mm -hmm. um, and Zynga is an African name that she learned um, from her youngest days, you know, where I said to her, never allow anybody to mispronounce your name, never allow anybody to misspell your name, because mispronounced or misspelled loses its meaning. Mm -hmm. And so always make sure that people understand um, your name and what it means. And so it was important for me to do that for her, to give her an, an identity of where she was, of who she is in this world, um, and who she is in her life, and to be able to explore that for herself. We just came off an election where there was a lot of talk about girl power <laughs> or woman power. Mm -hmm. um, what, is there a power that's pregnant in taking your daughter to Africa for the first time? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was for me, and yeah. so I know it was for her. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we always talk about uh, boys, yeah. you know, when it comes to fatherhood. Sure. But parenting our girls is just as important um, to give our girls a broader perspective, to empower them, to raise their self-esteem, um, to let them know that they can do anything in this world. They can be anything they want to be in this world. For me, that was important for me to be able to show her that she could go anywhere on the face of this planet. Planet, um, and learn some things. And there's a connection for her yeah. um, as a young girl across the globe. And so for um, that experience for me, um, taking her to Africa uh, wasn't only enlightening for her, but was, it was enlightening for me because it also showed me the power that I have of being a father. So Nzinga, um, I am always uh, excited to talk to people who've gone to Africa for the very <laughs> first time. Mm -hmm. And the question I always find myself asking to start our conversations, I'll ask you the same question, is what were the stereotypes you had before you went? <laughs> <laughs> See, it, it works every time. <laughs> what were the stereotypes you had before you went and what surprised you most? Um, stereotypes, yeah. basically like the commercials on TV where mm -hmm. you see like the starving kids on the mm -hmm. side of the road. And like at that time, that was when Ebola was big. So mm -hmm. everybody was like, oh, be careful, like Ebola's out there. And I'm just like, okay, like whatever. And um, just like the different people and like the dirt roads and like the wooden houses and just things you see on TV, nothing like yeah. it actually was. And what, and what was it actually like? Um, 
in a sense, you did see the dirt roads, yeah. but the people, you never seen starving kids in the, like begging for anything on the side of the road. Everybody was out working, selling water, selling food on the side, trying to get you to buy something from them. Mm -hmm. um, people, they were always up doing something. I never saw anybody sitting down, not doing anything, not trying to find something. Even kids were out there trying to sell stuff like at the school and everything. Mm -hmm. So it just wasn't like lazy people just sitting back. They were all like trying to make a living for themselves. Yeah. How did you connect to the kids that you met? Um, the girls that I met at the school, they were kind of going through the same things that I were going through as like a teenager in high school. I mean, to a different extent, mm -hmm. but like they were all going through like trying to fit in and like some girls had family issues and like they had problems like coming to school. Like this one girl, she was talking about how like she walked like miles to come to school every day and there was another girl who had a baby and like she still wanted to get her education. So it was different extents, but they, we were all going through the same things in mm -hmm. terms of like being a teenager and still. What did you, what, what, what did you learn or what, what were your takeaways in Zynga about their understanding, appreciation, embrace of education as compared to your classmates here stateside? <laughs> um, they definitely appreciate education way more than we do in the United States. I think because we get it for free here and mm -hmm. we're technically forced to go to school, it's like, oh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to, what do I need to learn this for? But since they have to pay for it and they have to fight for their education, they care about it way more. And if they can get an education, they will. Mm -hmm. So I've seen people from all over coming to get their education, all ages and different grades, like, but they all wanted to learn. And they were all very adamant, like, they wanted to get their education for to better their families and to better themselves. Yeah. I've, I've, I've often said that, um, the best way to really appreciate America, and conversely, the best way to critique America <laughs> is to get outside of America. Mm -hmm. Most Americans don't own passports, and mm -hmm. many of us who do never use them. Mm -hmm. So you can't really appreciate this country or much less critique this country earnestly mm -hmm. until you step out and look at it back from a distance. Mm -hmm. When you got back out of America from a distance, what did you see? Um, people, I just feel like people are ungrateful mm -hmm. for the things that, I feel like everything is handed to us here in a mm -hmm. sense that we forget free education, technology is basically handed to us, and I feel like we undermine the stuff that we actually get, and they don't get that. So I feel like it's kind of a blessing that we get our education for free, and we have homes to live in, and we have people around us that there's still support here, and I feel like people in America don't see that we have so much. They think that, oh, we're, we don't have as much as other people have, but we really have way more yeah. than other people have. So many kids here, as you well know, complain about everything. Mm -hmm. Even though they have, they complain still about what they don't have. Mm -hmm. Did you hear a lot of complaining over there? No. Yeah. Pe never. I not once heard somebody complain about, because they don't know what they don't have. Mm -hmm. So they're not complaining about the things that they don't have because they don't know what they don't have. Yeah. So they think that they have everything. As long as they're eating and they have somewhere to sleep and they have people who support them and love them, they're, they're happy. Yeah. And I feel like that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. What, what were the cultural takeaways from this trip? You know, we were talking a little earlier, um, similar to what you were just talking about, about they don't know what they don't have mm -hmm. and the perspective that we have when we see things. And so, you know, where we see people without shoes and we go, oh my God, they don't have shoes. And, and they're saying, well, we don't need shoes. Um, that's not my need. Mm -hmm. That's your need for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that now I understand being in America and the work that we're doing for our communities that you have to ask people what they need. And so that was a cultural shift for me because we're so prone to telling people what they need. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw that now in my work, I often say, what do you need? Because I really don't know what you need. There's a continuum from the have and the have nots. And we believe that we know what the nots don't have, and we believe that the haves have everything, mm -hmm. which in the middle of it is opportunity, mm -hmm. right? In the, media, in the middle of it is what are the opportunities that the have-nots don't have, and what are the opportunities that the have want to see more of? Mm -hmm. And so if I could speak from that paradigm, learning that from Africa, I could do a better job with the people that I'm mm -hmm. serving, because now my mind is a little more open in asking mm -hmm. them what they need. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking of the late, great uh, Reverend Dr. Leon Sullivan and his annual African African American Summit, mm -hmm. um, which leads me to ask, what did you, what were your takeaways 
about the relationship or lack thereof between Africans and African Americans. You all went there, of course, mm -hmm. as African Americans. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, I learned something extremely interesting um, because this was my third year going. Mm -hmm. And the first year we went, we trained 300 teachers across the country of Ghana mm -hmm. um, on American educational techniques. Mm -hmm. And I did a piece on community engagement and parental engagement. And I asked this question, much to you, that you asked us earlier, what do you know about America? And I'm going to tell you what I know about Africa from what I heard. Mm -hmm. And what I learned in that conversation is that we believe that Africans are taught about our experience in America, and they believe that we're taught about our experience or non-experience in Africa when neither of those two things occur. Mm -hmm. And so we just automatically believe that when we're talking to Africans that they understand our plight in America and they understand that we're taught about their plight in Africa and we have no clue what's going on back and forth. So from a cultural standpoint and an educational standpoint, I think oftentimes we're misled by the stereotypes. Yeah. The very first time I went to Africa many years ago, I think I've been to probably 16 countries over the years, but the very first time I went, I didn't get a chance to go with your dad, but I went with a woman named Maya Angelou, mm. and I went to, to Ghana, and she took me with her for a couple of weeks there, um, and I couldn't wait to get back after that first trip. So let me ask you, you ready to go back again? Yes, yeah. I am. I just want to go back and like kind of show everybody what I've been doing for them and like yeah. show them that everything they said to me and everything they told me, like I. I listened and I heard what they had said and I want to help like I don't I'm, I didn't just come just to like take pictures and like kind of mm -hmm. say oh yeah I went to Africa like I want to help you guys and I want to be there for you like you were there for me even though you didn't really know that yeah it's powerful it's a project uh, wonderful documentary called a queen's discovery this would be the queen uh, in Zynga <laughs> and she has the right name as Kenneth said earlier it's a queen's discovery it can be seen on most of these PBS stations on December the 9th be sure to check it out. It's a powerful documentary that will be, I think, both enlightening, empowering, uh, and for that matter, inspiring when you get a chance to check it out. Kenneth and Nzinga, congratulations. Thanks Thank for Thank taking you. the trip, and thanks for coming to talk to us about it. Thank, Thank you. you. My pleasure. Up next, Meg Ryan on her directorial debut and starring role in the film Ithaca. Stay with us.